Okay, so the last video we just quickly ended um, discussing z-scores. So just a couple of things with z-scores. Number one, please make sure that you always label when you are finding z-scores with the z equals. And then also make sure that you remember that z-scores don't have any units. And the reason for that is, is we're standardizing the score. So anytime you standardize something, it doesn't have any units. So you can basically compare it to something else that doesn't also have any units. So uh, what a z-score will do is it will tell us how many standard deviations deviations from the mean in observation falls and in what direction. So is it one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three, and then if it's positive, it's above the mean, negative, it's below the mean. Let's just go back to Jenny. So let's say that she earned a score of 86 on her test, the class mean was 80, and the standard deviation was 6.07. So remember the general standard deviation means on average how many points away did the class score from that mean score of 80. What is her standardized score? So that's asking the question, how many standard deviations is she away from 80? Now let's think about this for a second. If the class mean is 80, her score was 86 and the standard deviation is 6.07, so she's six points above the class. That means she's going to be a little bit more than one standard deviation away from the mean. So let's see what the work looks like for this. Please make sure that you have the z equals. This is your observation, her 86 minus, we're all, always seeing how far away it is from the population or from what we already know is the 80, divided by the standard deviation is 0.99. Alright, so that's actually, that's about correct because 6.07 was one standard deviation, hers is a little bit less than that, so it's a little bit less than one standard deviation below the mean. Now, what exactly does this 0.99 mean? It means that Jenny is 0.99 standard deviations above the mean score of her class. All right, so that is, that's telling us that she is about one standard deviation away from the mean. So she's higher than the mean, she did better than the rest of the class. All right, so how can we use that z-score to compare that specific position on that statistics test to another statistics test? So let's think about this for a second. Let's compare that to her chemistry test. So if we want to say, did she do better on her statistics test or her chemistry test, well, how, how can you really tell unless they're in the same units? So on her chemistry test, she scored an 82. However, the chemistry scores were fairly symmetric with a mean of 76 and a standard deviation of 4. So different scores on the test, different standard deviations in the two classes 6.07 and 4, and different means 80 and 76. We want to know on which test did she perform better relative to the rest of her class. So our standard deviation, remember, since that's standardized, it just tells us how many standard deviations she was above or below the mean. So we already know from statistics that she scored about one standard deviation above the mean. How about chemistry? Our observation, how far was she from the mean? divided by the standard deviation, 1.5. Well, she was only one standard deviation away in statistics, but in chemistry, she was 1.5. That's a pretty big difference. So she did better in chemistry because she was further above the mean. All right, so she had a better score in chemistry in relation to her peers since she was higher above the mean in chemistry than in statistics. All right, so let's go back to Macy and Brody and let's see who's actually taller. So in order to do that, we want to find their z-score. So on average, how much taller is Macy than her three-year-old peers? How much taller is Brody than his three-year-old peers? Observation was 100 minus the mean of three-year-olds was 94.5 divided by four. So she's 1.375 standard deviations above the average height. Brody, 158 minus the population divided by the standard deviation is 1.125 standard deviations above the mean. So Macy is actually taller in relation to her peers than Brody is because she's more standard deviations above the mean. So she's m taller than the average than Brody is. And that's how standardized scores help us to compare things that aren't necessarily in the same units. So why do we need to standardize our scores? Okay, the point of standardizing scores is that we can compare individuals from different distributions and different scales. So let's say, you know, in, um, 
New Zealand, they measure everything in kilograms, and in the States, they measure everything in pounds. So how could we compare if they're in different units? We could use z-scores. So a lot of you have taken SATs and ACTs, so how do they use those scores if you can submit either your SATs or your ACTs? Well, what they do, the scores are reported differently. They standardize the scores in order to make the comparison. So z-scores allow us to give meaning to our numbers if we collect data that is in different units. It's kind of like a car common yardstick for all types of units. Um, Z-scores are often used for getting your height and weight. I don't remember, you know, if you remember as a child, they would say you're in the 56th percentile or you're in the 25th percentile. That's where all of that comes from. Um, they also use it to test for defects in merchandise. So um, we are, you know, too many of our light bulbs are not lasting their the standard deviation of the light bulbs lasting are below the mean, which would mean that um, we need to work on the light bulbs and get them to last a little bit longer. So what's important to say about z-scores? There's a whole slide for this for a couple of reasons. <laughs> Number one, on the AP exam, you have to show your work. If you don't show your work for your z-scores, you will not get full credit. You have to do, you can do the calculation on the calculator, totally fine, but don't ever report a z-score without showing the plug into the formula. So you have to also label it as z equals because later on not everything's going to be z-scores. So make sure you show z-score, all the numbers plugged in, and then z equals at the end. Okay, so that's really important because if it's, um, you only get partial credit if you don't do that. So the last thing we're going to take a look at is transforming data. So we're going to take a look at transforming a distribution. All transforming data means is it takes the original observations from the original units of measurements and moves it to another scale. Um, transformations are going to affect the center, the shape, and the spread of the distribution. Now we didn't, so that's kind of like socks, we didn't include outliers because that's kind of basically in, lumped sort of in there with the spread of the distribution. So let's say we have a distribution. Um, let's say that we are taking a look at the height of all three-year-olds and we say that, oh, we were actually wrong. By We measured everything off by three units because I put the um, ruler at three inches instead of at zero inches. So what's going to happen to my distribution if I add three to every single score? So when you add three to every single height, what it does is it changes the measure of center, okay, and which means it would change the measure of the mean, the median, the quartiles, and the percentiles but it doesn't change the shape of the distribution. So sort of think about a, um, a number line. So if we have all the heights of all of the three-year-olds and we literally just add three to each of the heights, what's it gonna do? It's gonna kind of move it down that number line. The mean, if the mean was 53, it's gonna move it up to 56. If the median was 54, it's gonna move it up to 57 because I've added three to every score. The quartiles, if the lower quartile was 50, move it up three as it to changes it to 53. It doesn't change the shape because think about a number line, I'm just physically moving it down the number line, or it doesn't change the spread. So the range, even if the quartile was from 50 to 60, right, and then I moved it up three, if it goes from 53 to 63, that IQR still has an IQR of 10, okay? Doesn't change, since it doesn't change the shape, that also means or the spread, that means it doesn't change the standard deviation. There's still the same distance from a move, from the mean. I've just taken the entire graph and shifted it right three. Okay, so by adding or subtracting a constant from each value, you're essentially moving the data right or left along a number line. As you add and subtract data, or sorry, add and subtract, think of the mean, median, quartiles, and percentiles. They're just moving up and down the number line. You haven't changed the shed, spread, you haven't changed the shape, sorry, is combining shape and spread, but that doesn't work. Um, they don't change at all. Okay, so let's just take a look at this example. So here's a graph of a table of summary of statistics for a sample of 30 test scores. The maximum possible score was 50 points, okay? So we have n is how many, the mean, 35.8, the standard deviation, the minimum, quartile one, medium, quartile three, max, IQR, and the range, okay? Let's suppose that the teacher was nice, all right, looked at the scores and was like, eh, maybe I didn't give them enough review. All right, let's add five points to each test score. How is this going to change the shape, the center, and spread of the distribution? So take a 
quick think about it uh, before you move on to the next slide to see how you would do. All right, so what does this do? So here was the original scores. What we literally did was we just took all of these original scores and re shifted them to the right one. So this score, which was originally, this was my minimum, was at 12, just moved it over to 17, boom. All right, my um, mean, which was 35.8, so my original mean was about right here, boom, just shifted it right down here to 40.8. So it took that whole graph and just shifted it. So basically I added five to the mean, the minimum, quartile one, median, quartile three, and max. But notice my um, standard deviation didn't change. The, the data looks exactly the same, literally looks exactly the same, shifted it down. Okay, so the IQR is the same exactly the same because I just took it and moved it down because the IQR tells us how spread apart they are. It hasn't changed the spread, okay, so from 32 to 41 is 9, from 37 to 46 is still 9, still exactly the same. Okay, so what happens if we double the scores? All right, suppose that the teacher in the previous example wanted to convert the original test scores to percent. Because the test was out of 50, we're going to multiply each of them by 2 to make them out of 100. All right, so let's see what changed here. All right, so every single score is getting multiplied by 2 because I'm now making it out of 100. Okay, so the, the original minimum was 10 or sorry, the original, original minimum was 12. When I multiply that by two, that multiplied the original minimum by two of 24. So all of these are gonna get multiplied by two. Notice now the IQR is bigger. Why? Because my minimum went from 12 to 24, sorry, my quartile one went from 32 to 64, and my quartile three, when I multiplied it by 40, by 2, 41 by 2, became 82. So now my spread is from 24 to 82, 64 to 82, sorry, I keep looking at the minimum, bah, okay, so which means my IQR is also now multiplied by 2. Also take a look at the graph. This does, the original ones do not look as spread out as the ones that were multiplied by 2, okay, but notice now my mean has also gotten multiplied by 2 and my standard deviation because these scores are much more spread out than the scores right here. So this only goes from like 12 to 50 or this one goes from 24 all the way up to 96. That's a much larger spread so that means my standard deviation is much larger. Okay, this is just a uh, <laughs> quick little um, comic for you to take a look at. Just funny, it made me laugh. Okay, so one last thing about density curves, our measures of center and spread apply to density curves as well as to actual sets of observation. So the median of a density curve is equal areas points. So the median literally just splits it in half. So a density curve is basically like taking a histogram, drawing a curve over the top of it, and shading it in. That's all a density curve is, okay? So the median of a density curve is literally, okay, it's in the middle. Half the observations below, half the observations above. The mean of the density curve is the balance point. So how, if you were on a balance, half the weight would be on one side, half the weight would be on the other side. Um, the median and mean are the same for a density curve if they're symmetric or approximately normal, they're both in the center. However, the mean and median for a density curve are different if you have a right or left skewed distribution. And this follows the exact same um, strategy that we talked about earlier whenever we talked about histograms deciding whether to use the mean or the median. So the mean is the balance point. Notice the median or skewed to the right here is where most of the data is. The mean is pulled down a little bit by this by my or pulled up actually by my higher scores. It's pulled in this direction so the mean is actually higher than the median in this case. Okay but notice it's the balance point where it's going to keep my my scale balanced. All right, so in this section, we talked about percentiles and z-scores, cumulative relative frequency graphs, and how we can transform data. If you have any questions, please let me know.